I'm going to run through a bit more about integration um, and what are, are the kind of family hubs policy, as policy aspirations around integration. Um, and then Steve and Catherine are going to say a bit more about um, what that looks like in practice. Um, so, why should things be integrated? I guess in its kind of simplest form, uh, when there's a single need, this is a family, a family of ducks. Um, we're going to really keep with the bird based analogies for this presentation. Um, but if we think about a single need, say a housing issue, um, then, you know, there really isn't a need to work together. Um, you can have a single worker. The families are represented by ducks and the kind of professionals are represented by seagulls. Um, who's the housing worker who can help meet the single need? Because um, there's a single intervention. However, most families have multiple needs. Um, so in this family of ducks, we have um, some kind of financial difficulties. We have housing difficulties. Um, the kind of mother duck is pregnant um, and she's struggling to attend her antenatal appointments. We've got ducklings with problems at school and low mood. Um, a kind of uh, little duckling with problems at nursery. And then uh, some one of the ducklings with speech and language delays and also some kind of health conditions. Um, this family doesn't have, there's no child protection or child in need problems, but there are multiple issues going on with different children and different parents. And so there are all these different seagulls or professionals who are getting involved um, from multiple services in different ways um, and with their multiple different interventions. And this is um, what we're calling the seagull effect, where you have all these different workers who are sort of coming around you. Um, and I think, you know, we can all... <laughs> I feel like an affronting analogy, but I think we can perhaps relate to that a little bit, what it's like to, um, you know, be part of a group of professionals um, around a family and how we do that in a way, you know, we have these team around the family structures um, how we do that in a way that isn't overwhelming um, to families. And, and we do know that, um, that it, it can be very overwhelming particularly if you're a family who've experienced trauma, abuse and marginalisation. So if you have all these different seagulls kind of um, all around you, um, pecking away, kind of squawking the loudest. Um, and families have to end up repeating their stories of trauma or adversity, um, which, as I mentioned earlier, is something that is a huge barrier to engagement. Um, and as well as everyone being involved, there can also be the opposite. The seagulls, when there's so many involved, they can fly away um, because they can see there's so many people involved and there's this sort of sense of not for us. Um, and having strict criteria and, you know, sticking to your box. And we can become very inflexible, particularly when we're working with less and less resources with higher levels of need. And this is where people kind of fall through the gaps they don't quite meet the strict criteria um, that each individual services have. Um, and this is kind of problematic because structures have been built on the idea that you have a single need that's very, very severe and meets a threshold. And it doesn't consider um, as much as it could the kind of cumulative a burden of multiple, perhaps smaller, less high risk needs. Um, and that's where programmes like supporting families have been, um, you know, hugely valuable in thinking about all of that. Um, and, and I think there's some huge learning from that, the, the kind of innovation in that programme that we want to achieve within family hubs. Um, this is just some brief evidence on how common multiple needs are. Um, just really taking a mental health lens. So this is within the CYPI app data um, of nearly 100,000 cases. Um, 
and you know of those um cases um you know, one in two have family relationship difficulties, one in three self-harmed, one in five reported parental mental health issues, one in eight had experience of abuse. This is really, really common. But if you are presenting with one of those things, um, you might not meet a threshold for, say, CAMS. And because there's mental health present, you might not meet a threshold for, say, family support. So I think what we're trying to say is, how can we define need differently? How can we define service boundaries differently? Um, and this was really also highlighted in the case for change um, that services are owned by different departments. And it's, you know, this is the voice of a, a, a practitioner. Um, and it's just too complex and they fob you off and pass you on to someone else because they are all gatekeeping to keep to their budgets. And it's not that on a kind of individual practitioner level or even on an individual service level that that isn't adaptive to some of the huge challenges that practitioners face. Um, but it, it isn't what ultimately helps families. And so we're trying to think about this in a different way or try out thinking about it in a different way if there's a way to integrate that will help overcome this or think about need in a different fashion. So before handing over to um, Steve and Catherine, I just wanted to recap on what the Family Hub's policy aspirations are around integration. Those are the ones that were published this morning in the um, Family Hub's framework. So co-production, making sure that what's at the heart of what we're trying to achieve has evidence, um, practitioner experience as well as family need and family experience at the centre. All of those things are considered. That we have a shared governance and leadership structure um, that is kind of considerate of some of the um, ambitions that are going on within our NHS with integrating care, bringing um, integrated care systems online, um, so that local authorities are working with CCGs and commissioning. Um, and you know, that's absolutely core in the long-term plan. Um, so I want to make sure that local authorities are kind of um, working alongside some of those changes as well. Um, that there's joint commissioning um, and uh, between health and social care and education um, and how VCS um, services are kind of included within that commissioning, that there's shared IT systems and data sharing. Um, I noticed that was one of the high things that came up in the poll, as well as virtual delivery, and those things are very interlinked. Um, that we create integrated referral systems um, so that, you know, a, a panel of representatives across all the various services that families um, may benefit from. Um, can think together about a family and, and what that central point of access is. There's a degree of co-location in those services, that there's integrated outcomes monitoring um, to help again. I mean, for me, outcomes is sort of like a language that we can also think about families. People often think that outcomes can be quite dry, um, but they can they can be so powerful in bringing services together and um, and creating really clear kind of objectives. And they really underpin the theory of change that Ben Lewin was talking about in his last talk. Um, ooh, brilliant. Um, and I think critically, it's linking to the relationships pillar. But of course, these policy pillars are overlapping. And um, to achieve integration and connection, um, this has a huge amount to say with relationships. And so to do that, um, we really need those professionals, the, the seagulls, to, to, to build trusting relationships with each other, as well as, of course, with families. Um, and they can often be really, really good um, at building the relationships with families. But it's often the first thing that falls off the edge, building the relationships with other colleagues, particularly when it's been 
when we've all been set up with this kind of competitiveness, keeping to our budgets, keeping to our corners. Um, and so how do we build this trust between staff? And I think one of the ways that we, you know, are proposing to try out as part of family hubs and using a kind of ambit model is how we might, instead of have this team around the family, how we might have a team around the worker and that there's a kind of coordinating worker who's building this, these kind of trusted um, relationships with all the other absolutely integral members of the, the system and team um, to integrate on behalf of the family. Um, so these are some of the things that um, are kind of behind what we mean by integration, which is a bit, you know, integration might mean lots of different things to lots of different people. And in the policy we're talking about, we talk about it in terms of connection. Um, but these are some of the aspects of integration that are in my mind when I'm talking about it in terms of family hubs. So, um, that's my bit. Um, so I'm going to hand over to um, Steve and Catherine now. So um, Steve is the supporting family strategic manager and he works across the, the by borough as it now is, which is a kind of joint um, uh, delivery landscape in London between Westminster Local Authority and Kensington and Chelsea Local Authority. And he's been kind of working in um, innovating family hubs delivery for the last three years. And his colleague, Catherine Drake Wilkes, who's a family hub manager in Westminster. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, um, Steve and Catherine, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Camilla. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So yeah, I'm Steve Bywater. Um, can just, just explain what I do. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you uh, a bit about what we've done, particularly in Westminster, in terms of developing family hubs over the last three years or so, and the kind of integration process that we went through um, as part of that. Um, just a bit, first of all, about Westminster. Um, I was listening in on uh, the colleagues from Cornwall earlier and was just struck about how different Cornwall is in terms of its geography and its population uh, to Westminster. But um, I think it's, and also actually some, some very common factors about how they've responded to developing family hubs. But um, I just want to sort of be clear about what goes on in Westminster. A lot of people have visited it at the time. They think of um, Buckingham Palace and the House of Parliament, but it's, um, it's quite a complicated borough. Um, it's very small. It's about probably about four or five miles from top to bottom, um, but with a really big population, 248,000 people and 18% um, of those are children. It's very densely populated. Um, some of the areas you can see in the map, um, in the bottom left-hand corner, for example, that's Hyde Parks, so obviously very few people live there. So a lot of, a lot of people living in, in quite a small space. It's a very diverse um, population as well. Um, or just under half of the residents were born outside of the UK and a huge number of languages are spoken by our children and families. Um, there's Steve, also, I'm not sure if you've shared the slides. Um, ah, okay. Thanks, Steve. I thought you were just doing a really excellent preamp. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would have known oh, until you I did it. everything <laughs> apart from the button that says share. So does that work? Thank you. Yeah. I was also Talking loving myself, Rosie's but... profile picture of a puffin that was in keeping with my like seabird thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hopefully you can now see a map of Westminster. <laughs> <And laughs> yeah, do you want to do it full screen, um, Steve? That would help, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. 
Um, I was just about to talk about mobility as well. So um, significant numbers of people move in and out of Westminster for a whole range of reasons, people relocating from abroad, but also families moving out, um, more people moving out than moving in. So a population that's quite difficult to keep track of. And um, a bit later on, Catherine will talk about um, some recent arrivals who have been um, asylum seeking or evacuee families that we've also been working with in the area. And that's just one of the sort of different um, balances that we, we, we need to sort of um, keep in mind when we're working with families. Um, also, high levels of uh, deprivation in some parts of the borough as well. So you can see the black and the red areas. Um, they're the, the, the areas where uh, which are, are most deprived um, and some of them amongst the most deprived in England, despite quite high levels of affluence in other parts of the borough. So as I said, a really complicated, interesting um, situation to work with, um, which is moving all the time. In terms of family hubs, um, so before we started thinking about family hubs, I think it, it's important to point out that we, we feel like we had very strong partnerships already across children, uh, children and family services, and that included the statutory and the voluntary sector and, and other, other agencies as well. And we had an early help partnership board, which has been in place for a number of years, which is, is, is mature. It, it includes a lot of different agencies who make very, very sort of big contributions in terms of their time and, and, and their sort of development of services as well. Um, and that's growing all the time. There were wider ambitions to develop hubs across Westminster um, three years ago. So, or three, more than that, um, with, with the aim to, I suppose, bring services closer to residents, uh, regardless of where they live, because it, although it's a small borough, it takes quite a long time to move from one area to another. And uh, that was backed up with um, various policy decisions, including a paper that went to the Health and Wellbeing Board, I think in 2016, looking at um, ways of organising services around this. More recently, in 2019, we developed a new early help strategy. And the important thing about that was it was very much developed by the partnership. It wasn't the council's strategy. It was the early health partnership. Uh, it was trauma informed where all the agencies involved wanted to work in a similar way. And we thought about the shared behaviors of um, different agencies. So no matter who families come into contact with, there is a kind of shared agenda of how, how we want to work with them. And I think ultimately it was wanting to have a, an early help system, which isn't just about having an early help team based in children's services, but anyone who works with families at the early stage, being able to provide um, a consistent response, um, a response from someone that families want to get the response from. Um, and also that, that point which has been made several times earlier about families not having to keep telling their story to different people. We also had shared ambitions to take our integration to another level. And I think that was one of the, the key kind of um, motivators for family hub practice. And then lastly, the supporting families agenda. So that's been my link with the family hub developments in Westminster. Um, we uh, applied for earned autonomy in 2018, which meant we had some funding which we could invest in our early help system. And there were a number of elements to what we've subsequently done that have been really accelerated by that. So in terms of what our vision is around um, family hubs, um, I think, again, I think Cornwall said it's not just about the buildings. And for us, the, the workforce being integrated is, is the most important part of that. So although some of them might be based in the same space, there is a virtual network of providers across the area. We want to look at children aged 0 to 19 rather than just the early years. Um, we had families feeding back to us that although they um, really valued the children's centers that we have, they felt they came to a bit of a cliff edge towards the end of that when their children started school and, and, and services were less coordinated. So we wanted a single approach to working with families across the area. And then the buildings themselves. So we have now got three family hubs. Um, two of them are in repurposed um, buildings, which are already being used. And there's also some co-location, but we've taken that a lot further with our, with our family hub offer. And there's a third one, which is being developed as well in the north west of the borough. Um, it's, they're seen as a focal point in the community. Um, again, people can go in and ask for support. And one of the um, reassuring things, I suppose, about the, the, the first family hub was families are increasingly um, encouraging each other to go and use family hubs. So families were kind of putting the message out there that there was something that families could, 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 could access, which would be helpful for them. 
And then all those, those are other concepts as well. So we, we, we were really clear we wanted whole family working, not just looking at children of a particular age group, making sure we thought about parents' needs, um, the importance of lead professionals, so someone to coordinate uh, the work that takes place, and moving towards the idea that everyone is an early health worker, it's not just a specialist team. Some of our ingredients for integration. So I talked about the sites, they're all in the areas with the highest level of need. So going back to the map, the black and red areas um, of the borough are where our family hubs are located. And I think also importantly, we've linked in with um, a number of voluntary sector organisations, which are other points of getting access to those services. So in, in each locality, there are different voluntary sector organisations that are, are partnering with family hubs around that agenda really important in terms of integration was the integrated leadership team model so we started that off in the south and Kathy might say more about this but um, a group of managers managing teams such as early help children's centers um, early um, school nurses health visitors and the voluntary sector organizations meeting together regularly developing a shared vision agreeing what they wanted to their family hub to look like if it was successful in one, two years time, and then developing action plans around that, which are shared. We funded um, a workforce development program from the Supporting Families funding that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that was really instrumental in getting people together to think about this common way of working, um, thinking about how to engage families, how to do assessments, if that was something that was, that was needed. Um, lead professional practice and some of the tools that we developed. We also trained staff on motivational interviewing and introduced a, a lot of agencies to systemic working as well through that. And as people always say with multi-agency training, one of the benefits was they got to know their colleagues in the area and had a very real network and visited each other in their different offices and so on. So that was bringing things alive. We also tested new roles. So um, the family navigator has been a really important role that we've developed through this process. Um, they're a first point of contact for families who might come into the family hub for the first time. Uh, they're a multi-skilled team of uh, people with different backgrounds, uh, professional backgrounds. They also link in with um, agencies like GPs and schools, so we can make sure that the message about what's available in family hubs is, is available to, to more families. And also they model integrated working in terms of coordinating networks, acting as maybe the initial lead professional, but also engaging other agencies in a plan. We had a shared outcomes plan, um, or developing that particularly over time, but we got a baseline from staff and also the community around the areas we're developing hubs to sort of get their view on what it feels like to access services um, and, and respond to some of those messages. So there was that sort of post five issue where the support wasn't available as it was before. And they also told us that we were really old fashioned. We weren't using digital tools, we were using too much paper. So that was one of the other messages we wanted to take forward. Information and data sharing has been something that we have to focus on quite a lot. We haven't got 100% of the way there that we'd like to, but we've got a number of things in place so we can share more information about families within family hubs. And we also developed a digital tool where any agency can register a family with a family hub. And also we can develop a family plan online. Uh, again, any agency can do that. Families can contribute to it and the plans can be shared digitally. And then just more generally, we did a lot of joining the dots. So I talked about universal services linking with schools and GPs. We've got a really big program at the moment, uh, transforming the way we support families from pre-birth to five um, and developing a more consistent approach to that and, and innovating where we can. And family hubs are a really big part of that program. Um, we're also doing that across two boroughs. Uh, so, so Kensington and Chelsea also have family hubs. And just a really, a really good way to kind of focus a lot of agencies on shared outcomes, um, new roles, that whole family approach and lead, lead professional working and so on. We've linked into the youth agenda. So um, I suppose one of the issues is like young people aged probably in their teens, do they, would they want to go to family hubs? We hope so. And they, they have come to some of the programs that have been put on, but also we do have youth hubs, which are sort of partnered up with our family hubs and the managers of the youth hubs also attend the local integrated leadership team encouraging them to think about whole family working and making sure we link in together 
We've also planned transitions from primary to secondary school in the last year through family hubs. So identifying children who might have difficulties and then coming up with a kind of multi-agency plan to support them again with a lead practitioner to make sure that they have good activities to do over the summer holidays and then support when they go to secondary school for the first time. And I talked about by boroughs working as well. It's been really useful to have two boroughs um, working on a similar agenda, but allowing some difference. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits is going to come out of the days like today when we're expanding that even further. And finally, sort of communications and branding as well. So our family hubs look slightly different now to the buildings they used to be. The insides are very, very different. And we have things like shared logos, which re reinforce that idea of an early help system. I'm just going to pass over to Catherine now, who's going to talk a bit about Besbro, which is our first family hub, which opened in 2018, and how that's working in practice. Thanks, Steve. Um, so, yes, we, we moved our existing children's centre into a building which was known in the community where our colleagues from midwifery and health visiting and social work and targeted early help were already based but perhaps worked still quite separately, even though they were in the same building. Um, and that's where um, bringing in an integrated leadership team um, was really essential because staff on the ground who work with families can see how integration is going to help. And often very senior managers can see how integration will be beneficial and avoid duplication. But when uh, you're a team leader or a, a, a manager of a, a service or a, a voluntary sector organisation, you have a responsibility to look out for your staff and to think, well, hang on, what are they being asked to do? Is their role changing? Um, are, are they going to be given extra work? We, we can't do this. So it's the, that level of manager that we needed to, um, we needed to join together and really think about how we all work together. Um, we thought about how the building could work better. Um, that's still a work in progress, I have to say. Uh, and we have learned from our first pilot family hub uh, as we've developed um, our next one at Portman in the Edgeware Road area. Um, we're working with old buildings that were built in the 30s and, and we're very glad that they were. Um, and they've been changed various times over the years, but we Want it, we, we wanted families to feel as though it's somewhere they feel comfortable to come. And with such a wide age remit, we want young people to feel that it's a place for them and not just a place for little children and babies. So we are constantly rethinking that. Um, the main thing, of course, is the coordinated support, the fact that families can come in and feel as though they're not going to be passed from pillar to post uh, and, and everyone has um, alluded to this. Um, it, we feel as though it, we're taking a real step forward in that, that we do have a single plan for a family that professionals will behind the scenes talk to each other and work out the issues with the different service remits. Um, can, can you go on to the next one Steve? Thank you. So um, we've had, uh, since we started, um, integration has had to make sense on the ground uh, and we've had a number of challenges as everyone has. Um, just the sheer number of families that each of the family hubs is working with in Westminster, how is it possible even with our family navigators um, to provide the right level of support to all the families who need it? Um, so that makes it really important to think about the role of the lead professional and to build that capacity in, in all of the services so that people feel confident that it's something they can do um, and it's not a, a lot of extra work that's been pushed onto them. Um, of course, COVID has happened uh, during the time that we've been developing our hubs. Um, and a lot of the things that we put in place in um, BESPRA, for example, birth registrations, parenting courses, family therapy clinic, um, housing advice, or, or, all of those things that you would have happening in a busy hub had to go virtual. Uh, and, and what does a hub mean then? Um, 
so as in all of our services, we had to be um, quite agile and um, actually embrace technology. <laughs> it forced us to do that. Um, but we were main, we, none of our hubs closed during the pandemic. Um, it was important to have somewhere that families who felt they were in danger and needed somewhere to go had somewhere. Um, so there was, we had staff who um, actually live in Westminster or very close by who were able to be in offering a service and posting out resources to families. Um, it seemed to really bring the partners in the hub closer together um, because it, it was a crisis and we had to think how are we going to get everyone through it. So um, we had services, for example, who had most of their staff on furlough, um, but they had a space. So they were able to say, well, if your staff um, are still working, they could come here to see a family. It's a bigger space. It, they'll be able to socially distance. Um, we had lots of examples of families in crisis during that time where they didn't really meet the remit for a service, but people would say, okay, we'll, we'll do something, I can see they need it. So it really helped us to, to have that partnership as, as a, a living example. Um, and it, it's something we, we take from that. I, I think it's interesting, our brains resist being in that crisis mode for too long, I think. Um, it's, it's probably a self-preservation thing that we, we quite quickly revert to sort of feeling as though this is normal now. Um, but I think those links that we forged really have stood us in good stead since then. Um, another example of how we've been able to be quite responsive and flexible to, to need is um, the number of asylum seekers who were placed in hotel accommodation. Um, during the pandemic and they were not able to be moved on to more suitable accommodation as quickly as um, we would normally have hoped. Uh, so they were placed there by the Home Office um, and families were, were living in one room throughout the lockdowns, not really knowing any of the local services, not knowing what was going on in some cases with COVID um it, it, a very very stressful situation so we were fortunate that we had brought in a family navigator to work in uh, our family hub close to three of those hotels to pick up the need there and really coordinate a, a team around that hotel so all, all the seagulls were swooping down on the the hotel professionals rather than the families to continue camilla's uh, analogy um and really think about which organizations could support um and how we could do something safely to actually um meet the very practical needs of those families um and and that need is still there um there are there are just so many uh, asylum seekers in the system that we we still have a large number of them placed in westminster and we're thinking about how we can um, balance those needs and, and maintain that support. Um, probably better go to the next one. Um, so this is just, um, was asked to come up with a, an example of, of how a family experience integration and what difference it makes for them. Um, this was a 13 year old girl who um, has two adult siblings, one still living at home and both her parents. Um, and uh, she was referred into uh, the front door of children's services in Westminster uh, by a referrer who was worried mum had experienced emotional abuse from father um, and what impact that was having on the daughter. So this was felt it didn't need to go to a social work team or even a targeted early help team, but we could do some real early intervention work uh, from our family navigator team. Um, what the navigator discovered was that um, memory issues had been described for the dad, but he actually very sadly has a, a rapidly deteriorating form of dementia. And this is what was leading him to um, act in a very uncharacteristic way and in a way that hadn't um, taken place for, uh, throughout the marriage. Um, this was obviously very, very difficult for the whole family. Um, 
and there was a very difficult relationship between mum and daughter. Mum really wanted to protect her daughter from everything, um, but this was leading to quite um, a lot of concern about her emotional well-being. Um, I, I feel with this audience, I want to um, pay tribute actually to um, a member of the team around the family who was another young person um, who was very, very mature and explained to this girl that he was very worried about her and he needed to talk to safeguarding professionals in his school because, uh, and he understood that she might end her friendship with him, but he, he needed to keep her safe. Um, so the family navigator really became the focal point of contact for the family um, in this network and it became quite a large network including the school, the school nurse, adult social care, hospital teams, dementia nurses, befriending, um, so lots and lots of um, very important seagulls who needed to do their their role in caring for a very unwell man and the impact on his family. Um, but the navigator was the person that both mum and daughter could go to. Um, and she was coordinating the links with that network, um, which included care planning meetings in hospital, for example, but working in a systemic way on the relationship between the mum and daughter and they both now feel that they can communicate better with each other and that they can negotiate this difficult time in their family life in a more positive way. Um, so I think that's that's the end. We've probably talked for too long, um, but I'm gonna hand over for, oh no, next steps, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, uh, where are we going next? So, um, we do have to open our third permanent family hub site, um, which is up in the northwest of our locality. And that's quite exciting because that will be a, a site that wasn't one of our former children's centres or um, health centres. It, it will be a chance to design it uh, and more co-design from the community. Um, we are, but the, the, the hub is still working up there in a virtual way. Um, so all the integrated leadership team is there, the navigator is there, there but it, they will move to a more purpose design building. Um, at the moment, we're very um, taken up with redesigning the pre-birth to five pathway um, in, in a very much more integrated way. Um, thinking of, uh, about everything from uh, first contact with midwifery services um, through early years. Um, and although that um, is, isn't the 0 to 19, it, we're very much a part of that. And it does take into account those issues that Camilla mentioned with commissioning, um, because that's a, previously commissioning timetables haven't been always the same as ours. So there is a lot of work going on and our children's centre and our health visiting teams, for example, will be employed as part of the same teams, even though they have different um, employers. Um, so it is going to be a, a big change coming next year for us. Um, and, it, and it takes the next logical step towards integration. Um, we do need to um, renew our workforce development and take that more in-house so that it's more sustainable so that practitioners are able to lead on that and managers are able to uh, deliver workforce development uh, in a tiered way so it, uh, new members of staff will get induction, um, people who can be lead professionals can get lots of support around that role. And those professionals who are really experienced and have been doing essentially this work for a long time can um, not just learn the same things over again, but that can actually be developed and ha can have really um, value added to their experience. Um, Camilla touched on an outcomes framework that has been um, a challenge that we, we've been grappling with um, and we're continuing to develop that. Um, COVID recovery, I think is, we, we need to look at what's worked well during the pandemic, what's actually some families have engaged better virtually, 
of what are the things we want to keep, what are the hybrid ways of working that mean we can be more agile, um, but who's fallen through the gaps, who's really struggled. Um, and I think some of the economic impacts of the pandemic are, are going to be with us for some time. Um, we're continuing to try to be smarter at targeting people who need us most uh, and to do that before they come to us. Um, so to actually use some of the, the data we have um, and be, be able to actually predict need rather than be more um, reactive. Um, and uh, while we're here today, really sort of engaging and learning from others uh, because there's so much uh, good work going on throughout the country on family hubs, which we, we've always experienced and um, had really good dialogue. So we definitely want to do more of that. Thank you everyone for listening.